Lord be with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our worship service this morning is divine service setting four on page 203. We stand for opening hymn 545. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Then your righteousness deliver me.
Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully hear our prayers, and having set us free from the bonds of our sins, deliver us from every evil. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Quinquagesima is from 1 Samuel, chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he says, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, 
endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. So now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. <clears throat> Taking the twelve, Jesus said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon, and after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, May be seated. We welcome you this morning to the Zionian Angelic Lutheran Church. We welcome our visitors and guests. Please remember to fill out the fellowship pads at the end of your pews and pass them in. Really, it's how we get to know who's worshiping with us uh, this morning. Uh, just uh, one, well, two announcements. Number one, uh, Ash Wednesday, of course, is this uh, this coming weekend. As a reminder, uh, our services are now going to be at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, from Ash Wednesday all the way through the rest of the season of Lent. Uh, so it won't be at noon like it used to be, 11 o'clock. Uh, the other announcement is 
Uh, as you recall, the deaconess is coming this coming Saturday to give me a presentation on uh, anxiety and those suffering with mental illness. And uh, I've been especially asked to uh, let everyone know that this is also for men as well. And uh, I just wanted to read something from the Lutheran Witness uh, that I noticed. And it says that uh, research shows that one in five adults and one in six children will experience a mental illness in any given year. Over the course of a lifetime, one in three persons will be affected. So even if you are uh, a man and uh, you are, even if you weren't married, your mother, father, or you, odds are statistically that one of you is going to uh, have a mental illness at some point in your life. And this is intended to help equip you in caring for uh, those, including yourself, who uh, may be suffering with any form of mental illness. So I want to encourage uh, everyone to come. Thank you to the Life team who's uh, putting this together. I think this is a, a good thing to have uh, offered to help equip us to serve our neighbor. Uh, that's it for announcements, so we will continue with our hymn of the day, 849. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear these words again from the Gospel reading, Luke chapter 18, verse 42. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. So far the word of the Lord. What a great Gospel reading. I mean, they're all great as all of God's word is inspired by him and without error, holy men of God spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Contextually, though, this gospel reading perfectly sets us up for Lent. If you haven't gotten into the Lenten spirit these last two Sundays, today certainly sets the tone. If after today you still aren't ready to follow Jesus to the cross, May the Lord be merciful to you and give you the spiritual sight as he gave physical sight to the man in our text. Before we get to that part of the reading, we first have to consider Jesus' words leading up to this. 
Jesus took the twelve and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. By chapter 18 in Luke, Jesus has almost made it to Jerusalem for the final time. Jericho is the last big city between the two, and they were about a day's journey apart, 15 to 20 miles. If you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, the road between Jerusalem and Jericho was dangerous, notorious for highway robberies. It was known as the way of blood. This is fitting, of course, for our Lord fulfills this nickname as he traverses it, ultimately to pay for the sins of the world with his shedding of it on the cross. Our text today occurs just before Jesus gets to Jericho. After this, we have the famous story of the wee little man Zacchaeus as Jesus passes through Jericho, and then we get Jesus' triumphal entry into the holy city. So we are close, real close, like seeing those signs after a long trip that says you've now entered Franklin County or Columbus city limits. Almost home. Trips almost finished. That's exactly what Jesus tells his disciples. Everything that the prophets said about him were about to be telesthesitai. That Greek word is the same exact word, though in a different tense, that Jesus would use as his final word before bowing his head and giving up his spirit on the cross. To telestai. It is finished. Ready for Lent now? If not, the Lord is patient with you, just as he was with his disciples. He tells them, for he, that is the Son of Man, will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. Jesus could not have been any clearer or more straightforward. Yet Luke tells us, not once, not twice, but three times, that they didn't get it. He says first, but they understood none of these things. Then he says, this saying was hidden from them. Then he says, and they did not grasp what was said. The disciples... <clears throat> We're not ready to follow Jesus to the cross. For whatever reason, they were blinded by their own worldview of the Messiah. They could not grasp that those things could happen to their beloved Jesus, their leader, their son of David. It's very similar to how Samuel treated each of Jesse's sons as one by one they were brought before him in our Old Testament reading. Eliab walks in and Samuel thinks, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on outward appearances, but the Lord looks on the heart. As the Lord sees not as man sees, so also the Lord doesn't operate as man operates. Man is concerned with earthly kingdoms and power and glory. The Lord's glory is the cross, the suffering, crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. The disciples could not grasp or understand that the Son of Man had to endure these things to open up paradise for all believers, including them. A blind man <clears throat> was begging by the roadside as they neared Jericho. Hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. We do the same thing. We hear sirens going by outside our homes or drive past emergency vehicles on the side of the road with their lights flashing and we instantly develop crane necks 
to see what's going on. The blind man could not see, of course, but the commotion told him something important was happening. Well, they told him Jesus of Nazareth is going by. He wastes no time. Notice how he addresses Jesus. Not by his local name, Jesus of Nazareth, but he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This was a profession of faith. He was confessing much more than a name, but a messianic title, son of David. The crowd tries to shush him. Luke says those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Our English translations don't really paint the same picture as the Greek. Our English almost makes it seem like those who were in front of this blind man, as if they were between him and Jesus, who were the ones who were rebuking him. But it's actually those who were leading the pack, as it were. The ones leading the crowd out in front. This is highly significant. Jesus was not leading the way of this crowd. More on that later. The rebuke doesn't stop the blind man. Luke says he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And then what does Jesus do next? He stops. The Greek says he stood, but stops really helps paint the picture. It's not as if Jesus were sitting and then he stands up. He was walking now he stood still. He stood there. Imagine a parade going by and one person in the middle halts the whole thing. It disrupts the whole show. In front of him, the people might keep going. And back, people start bumping into one another. And that's the point. The blind man disrupts the progression of the horde. Jesus is not too busy to stop the momentum of the crowd so he can listen to the man in need. After standing still, he commanded him to be brought to him. Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has saved you. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. This blind, now seeing man, upon being healed, immediately follows Jesus. No delay. He doesn't say he needs to run home first and grab some extra things or say goodbye to his family or friends. The text says he immediately recovered his sight and followed Jesus, glorifying God. This same miracle happens every Sunday, even though it's not as obvious and certainly not physical. Sin sets scales over our eyes, and without God's word, we become more and more blinded from seeing the light of the world whom darkness cannot overcome. And yet every time God's word is preached or taught, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, bringing many to repentance and faith. The forgiveness of sins opens our eyes to see Jesus and we follow him to the cross, glorifying God, singing our hosannas. What do we do with this most precious gift? Do we seek to lead the crowd, rebuking those crying out for Jesus, telling them to be silent? Do we think we can do a better job leading the church with Christ somewhere behind us in our midst? The way of the crowd or the world is one way. And we rejoice when Jesus is moving the same direction as much of our nation's history has seen. But those times are rapidly changing. Jesus is ready to go to the cross. The world wants to stay and party in Jericho. If Jesus is not leading the way, <clears throat> the way then someone else will. And the way Jesus leads is through his word and by his word alone. Faith simply must trust him to lead. Faith simply must trust that when 
For if the word of God goes against what we think, feel, or experience, then it is our thoughts, our emotions, and our experiences that are in error. And we must put them in the back seat and let Jesus lead. Let Jesus lead you into the season of Lent, to Holy Week, to the cross, to the grave. Pick up your crosses and follow him. Sometimes the road he takes is the way of blood. Sometimes it's going to be scary. Many times it's going to be obvious that we are going to suffer because of it. God is faithful. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, we are quick also to pray, but deliver us from evil. Though our earthly sojourn may lead us into a valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for thou art with us. The Lord's way is not a path to perdition, but a gateway to eternal glory. As the son of David was merciful to the blind man, so also he is merciful to you. Cry out to him. He hears your prayer. Jesus is never too busy to save those who confess they need his help. That's literally what he came into this world to do. And that's exactly what he ascended into heaven to keep doing. He is our rock and our fortress. And as we confessed in the intro it, for his name's sake, he leads me and guides me. Jesus said, faith saved the blind man. His grace through faith saves you too. We will never be put to shame. In Jesus' name, amen. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious Father, you have dwelled in unapproachable light and shining glory. Illumine your Church and heal our spiritual blindness. Open our eyes to see the salvation you have prepared for us through your Son. Lord, in your mercy, preserve your Church and her ministers. Give pastors courage to embrace gladly the crosses of their office that following their example, all Christians may also bear the reproach of the world, the attacks of Satan, and the temptations of the flesh, and the confidence of Christ's redemption. Lord, in your mercy, preserve the family in all godly Christian homes. Give parents diligence and persistence in their duties to teach the faith in word and example. Keep all children in the promise you have made to them in their baptism. Let the patience, kindness, and endurance of Christian love have no end among us. Lord, in your mercy, look with compassion on all who are suffering, especially Marilyn, Dean, TC, George, and Keith. Assure them of your presence. Deliver them from the temptations of the evil one and heal them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, Lord God, Heavenly Father, what you foretold through the holy prophets has been fulfilled and accomplished in the suffering, death, and resurrection of your Son. You have set forth his passion and resurrection as the firm foundation and content for our faith. Have mercy on us and fix our eyes on the Son of David at all times. Give us courage to follow him through all adversity and every assault of the devil, 
and to view his passion with repentant hearts and delight. For by it you have redeemed us from all sin and evil. Comfort us with the certainty of Christ's resurrection, by which we have the confidence of eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We continue with the service of the sacrament on page 208. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. Blessed are you, O Lord, our, our, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. 
we give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This, too, in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.